but at the same time, you know, I've done so many incredible things. What's even more exciting, Trevor has documented his journey back to that spot on the mountain and into the history books in a new film called Full Circle. It premiered overnight at the Santa Barbara Film Festival, and Trevor says he's more comfortable backflipping in a sit ski than he is on a red carpet. Go figure, Andrew and Rena. All right, Will, thank you so much. Inspiring story there. Very inspiring. And that's the kind of love we need to spread today. That's what's exactly. making news in America this morning. Have a great day. It's Tuesday, February 14th. Two weeks doesn't sound like a long time if you might be returning to toxic chemicals. We start here. After a devastating train wreck, worried Ohio residents began moving back into town. It was like a mix of gasoline, paint thinner, and nail polish remover. Assurances from the EPA have only raised more questions about air, water, and freight trains. What could be so bad that a college would cancel basketball season? The abusive incidents usually occurred in front of the team and no one intervened. Allegations of locker room hazing have resulted in criminal charges. And it's not just you, everyone's tipping more. Give or take about 15 to 25 percent of my earnings uh, came from tips. We'll explain what's led to what some are calling gratuitous gratuity. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. It's been nearly two weeks since a freight train clattered off the tracks in Ohio just before it reached Pennsylvania. 50 Norfolk Southern rail cars derailed from the tracks Friday night. You can smell almost this odor of burning metal, burning rubber. From high above, you could see its cars looked like they'd just been tossed around like Legos. This derailment resulted in a huge explosion, a plume of smoke, but we've since learned that wasn't even the scariest thing about this. No, the even more deadly concern was what this freight train was carrying. The vinyl chloride contents of five rail cars are currently unstable and could potentially explode, causing deadly disbursement of shrapnel and toxic fumes. Vinyl chloride is the stuff that makes PVC pipe, and it was sitting there in those derailed cars. Pressure was building, as was the risk of a huge explosion. So officials decided to evacuate the area and burn this gas, releasing noxious fumes into the atmosphere. The creek by my house had a very, very strong chemical smell to it. Well, since that moment, Residents have been in a constant state of uncertainty. When do we come back? Do we come back? I uh, put tape on my door so no uh, uh, chemical can come in because I take care of my mother here. So, you know, I want her to be safe. Scientists insist the area is now safe, but what are the conversations like among families as they decide whether to move back into what was just days ago considered a deadly danger zone? I want to start the day by returning to the scene of this wreck as residents hesitantly return. We're joined by one of them, Ben Ratner. He's a resident of East Palestine. That's where this crash happened. And together with his wife, he owns a cafe right outside town. And first of all, Ben, can you, first of all, just describe East Palestine? Like, how central is this railroad to this community? It's, everything's based around the railroad. I mean, it's been here longer than most most of the businesses or buildings and things like that. That's the reason why a community sprung up was a railroad. It's not necessarily integral to people's day to day besides having to stop for the train, but it is something that's like very prominent. And before all of this, it was kind of said that on average, a train would come through every 13 minutes. Oh, so wow. it was very consistent. What do you remember about that day? The derailment happens. What are you seeing? Yeah, uh, my oldest daughter is on the high school basketball team and we got home right after a game and there's just definitely some commotion. <laughs> The fire department is visible from my back backyard. And so went on the back porch and saw trucks and everybody pulling out. And um, I just had never seen the size of smoke and flames billowing together. It was like, it was so high up in the air. It was unbelievable. As I was walking away, I took a little bit of video. So I have about 10 seconds of video from just crazy amount of flames. Got back home probably this time it's about 10, 10.30, and my wife and I are just not sure what 
to do. So really the concern at that point was fire damage, explosions due to fire. And then as we kind of- Like the got, stuff you'd expect from like a train like right, train wreck, right. you know, like a train explosion. Exactly. I went to work Saturday, still paying attention to everything. The train is still, still on fire and things started coming out early in the morning about the chemicals and the hazards that were involved there. We were notified a short time ago that we've had a drastic change in the chemical uh, inside the tank cars that we've been concerned about and watching all day, the vinyl chloride. My wife got a hold of me and said that they're putting out a full evacuation order for the one mile. We're within the one mile. Um, when I came back to help my wife pack everything up, you could you could taste it in the air. It was like mm. a mix of um, gasoline, paint thinner, and nail polish remover. Mm. It was it was unique. And, uh, and not just smelling it, but like taste like Oh, yeah, powerful. yeah. And I definitely, the first day, I did have... Uh, you know, after walking down there the next day on, uh, you know, after the fire, I did have irritation in my throat and things like that. Wow. Um, getting the kids out of here, leaving that day, cars are speeding away from town as I'm driving towards the town. And you get that fight or flight sense, like, what am I driving towards right now? And you see people just peeling out on the way down, heading west out of town. As I'm pulling into town, there's several sheriffs, police, like town police and state troopers. You know, you got to pull up to a barricade and explain, I need to get in there. And they're like, you're not going anywhere. And you're like, my wife and kids are in there. And it's like, it's out of a movie. And uh, so definitely was uh, nerve wracking and also eerie because I was an extra in the white noise movie that was filmed right down the street from here. Yeah, so I heard this yeah. when somebody mentioned your name, and this sounded too crazy to be true, that the movie White Noise that came out this past December... You see fire engines, or...? They're all over the place. Only it looks to me like they're not getting too close. It must be pretty toxic or pretty explosive stuff. It's about a train crash that creates a huge explosion and then a chemical emergency... And it was filmed near East Palestine. Like, you you were in this movie? Yeah, it would have been October of 2020. My dad and myself, we were, we were ex my kids actually got fitted for costumes, and they went up to Cleveland and everything, too. Um, but they ended like up You're just thinking this is like a cool family thing. Yeah, like, let's be yeah. extras in the local movie. Yeah, like, we, I, I love, I'm a little bit of a film buff. I'm into movies, and... Um, the very first, I thought of this thing immediately. It was the very first thing. The verbiage in the book is an airborne toxic event. That's the whole, the, the whole crux of the book is based around how this family reacts in the face of this event and how they get back to their lives after that and how we as a species rebound and good, bad, or indifferent, we really bounce back from things quickly. We turn the page quickly. Uh, and in this case, I'm hoping people don't turn the page too quickly because we really need to focus on the environmental impact and the health impact that's going to happen from this. With the full support and backing of Governor DeWine, I'm happy to announce that the evacuation order is now lifted. Even though they say it's okay now, of course we're all concerned about it. We are. Whenever I got back, it still smelled a little plasticky in the air. I'm, I'm asthmatic, so I immediately hit my inhaler. I could I could tell that it was hitting my chest. And you mentioned, like, you hope people don't move on to it. Like, do you feel like, like some families have complained that the issue is kind of be, being swept under the rug. We've gotten very little information, as the public at least. I'm wondering, are like, what are you guys being told in this moment about what's happening there and, and what's next for you? It's hard because there's not one singular voice to listen to. It's, uh, you know, the governor stopped in for two different conferences and he was out. Um, local officials are really at the behest of the EPA. We had Ohio EPA's toxicologists review that data. They, Norfolk Southern's had toxicologists review that data to ensure that the, the, the contaminants that were present in the water were still at safe levels. Yes, there were detections, but again, they remained at safe levels. Norfolk Southern is in charge of their own cleanup, which is uh, crazy, but so they're kind of waiting for information from these experts. You know, one of the news conferences before the evacuation order was lifted was really contentious and people were asking questions of the fire chief. I'm not an expert, subject matter expert on that. I'm a fireman. I put fires out. And the thing is, all the officials were right behind them. National Guard's behind them, EPA's behind them, um, Ohio Water's behind them, and any of those people could have stepped up and answered the questions of what are the safe levels that we want to be at before we allow people back into town or anything like that. All right, no, uh, we're, we're done with questions. Thank you very much. And they couldn't answer it. Uh, but then all of a sudden, the next day, less than 24 hours later, they say, go back home, it's safe. It's literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data points that we've collected over the time to show that the air quality in the town is safe and led to the decision for the fire chief to lift the evacuation. So to go from 
complete unknown when it's going to be safe to go back. And we can't even tell you what the levels need to be to 24 hours later, go back home, everything's okay. And then a half hour later, a train is running through town already. We already have trains running through town. Um, the trains are back already. It, trains have been back. Trains had to have been on their way before the order was lifted because trains were in town a half hour after the order was lifted. So that means those trains had to have been on their way from Chicago or Cleveland or wherever traveling um, into Pennsylvania. And that's something now we've noticed they are incessant. There used to be 13, 13 minutes between trains. Now it's a train goes and another one's coming because they're trying to catch back up on all the work that was lost. What's it like going back to the trains coming through? What's it like to hear them now? Um, not just for me, but everybody is, it's a sense of, uh, unease whenever you hear these trains and not to sound overly like emotional about things, but I mean, there is a level of PTSD whenever it's just like, Oh God, why do we have to hear these trains again already? Like there's no understanding of the level of chaos that people went through. And, uh, it's like, Immediately, they're back. People aren't even back into their homes. They're driving into town, and they're having to wait for a train. Um, it's and so it is, uh, you're you're back at home now, or how did you make the decision to come back? Um, it was a tough decision. We waited three days and two nights mm. uh, before we came back home. Um, before we made our decision, initially the feeling was, you know, the air is okay, the water for now is okay. You can get back to your houses, and you know, people. A lot of people jumped at that. We waited an extra couple of days. Um, but also, as I've been here now and seeing that the air isn't that big of a deal, but thinking about things and thinking about the chemicals and the way that the timing happened with the release of the information, the focus early was on the volatile chemicals. Um, and those, I think, in the end, were easier to handle and clean up because with the explosion, those dissipate out into the environment. Um, but they did not tell us about these petrol oil chemicals and these other things. There's a big thing that was found now is a petroleum, uh, based oil that has been found to have spilled at least 30,000 gallons. So that stuff is going to be sitting in the ground, leaching into the ground for who knows how long, but really this is going to be a longer water table, the soil issues, and eventually, you know, property home values are, are a big, big factor in the future. Well, I didn't even think about that, how suffocating that might feel to be like, maybe I'll pack the kids and get out of this one day or like, but then you think about, wait, I've got a business here. Mm -hmm. I've got a home here. What happens mm -hmm. with the home? Like we were in talks with a local, local, um, property developer to put a cafe in, in town here. Wow. Um, it would have been, you know, across the street from the train tracks. Uh, wow. and that's something that of course we'd still love to do, but cannot do until it is, you know, deemed safe to do so. It's going to be a while before we can make that decision, but there's, you know, our kids go to school here. They walk to school here. Um, you know, we have a, a two year old, a six year old, 13 year old and 15 year old, and they're all integrated fully in the community. And it's really hard to pull them out of that. Um, like I said, I, I coached the soccer team. And so that's something that is like near and dear to my heart that I'm surprised makes me emotional. You know, um, my two year old is on the loose, so he's kind of in the background <laughs> right here. here. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that, um, definitely feeling very trapped by the situation and hard to balance the safety and well being of everybody with the kids wanting to kind of get back to their normal lives and explain to them the situation at hand. Well, and I didn't even know this until recently, Ben, but in the last few years, it turns out, freight train companies have laid off huge numbers of workers. Like Norfolk Southern itself cut thousands of jobs in the span of just a few years. NTSB says this specific derailment goes back to a failed axle on one of the rail cars. But what Norfolk Southern is talking about, they're not commenting on that. What they are talking about is the cleanup. They say they're working with county, state, and federal environmental authorities. They're providing in-home air monitors to residents. And then they also made this cash donation of $25,000 to this town. They promised much more is on the way, but what was your reaction to that? Yeah, I, I think that it's laughable that $25,000, maybe if that's the initial payment or something, but, you know, our fire department has to throw away all of their gear, has to throw away all of their uniforms. Um, anybody who was there, um, same thing. They have to refurbish, re-outfit with equipment. $25,000 isn't, isn't going to do anything. It's going to be a drop in the bucket. You'd think that they would be more in touch to understand that you can't just wash over this with a check and, and, and start trains back up and be back on, uh, you know, back on schedule right after everything. 
Wow. And for their part, Norfolk Southern says they are donating more than $200,000 just to that fire department alone. They say they're covering the cost of families like yours who've had to uproot themselves. But you got to imagine that will just cover up to the days until the EPA said it was safe to move back in, as worrisome as that's been for residents like yourself. All right, that is Ben Ratner there back at his house in East Palestine. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, in the background, you may hear a train. It's passing through right now. Is that right? Wow. Next up on Start Here, it's not just a player who's suspended. It's the whole team. Quick time out. Then we'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. The biggest sports story of the week, of course, has been the Kansas City Chiefs' comeback Super Bowl victory. For the second time in four seasons, the Lombardi Trophy has a red and gold reflection. Billions of dollars went into making this a successful season for the NFL. But at the more local level, what happens when your local team just vanishes, just no longer ceases to be? Well, in perhaps the most shocking sports story of the new year, the men's basketball team at New Mexico State University has been disbanded, broken up for the year because of allegations of hazing that are now prompting criminal charges. USA Today sports columnist Christine Brennan is an ABC News contributor. And quick warning, this will involve descriptions of an alleged sexual assault. Christine, can you just walk me through what allegedly happened here? Brad, yes, and it is really troubling, the allegations. An unidentified player on the New Mexico State men's basketball team went to the police on February 10th, said he wanted to remain anonymous, uh, didn't want to pursue criminal charges, which becomes important in a few moments when you hear what he had to say and what is in the police report. Ongoing hazing incidents that allegedly occurred uh, in the locker room of the team at their arena and also at away games. That's according to a police report. Three teammates were identified to police as being directly involved in the hazing. Their names were redacted from the report. Uh, the player is alleging that abuse was most recent on February 6th, but it's been going on for months. And it's troubling what he says, that three teammates held him down, face down, and removed his clothing. The player struck his buttocks and touched his genitals, according to the report. Wow. The player said he had no choice but to let this happen because it was a three-on-one type of situation. He added that the abusive incidents usually occurred in front of the team and that no one intervened. If nobody was willing to help this one person, they're their teammate. That person, even if they weren't their teammate, they should have been protected by these men. That, that is person. what we've heard. And as a journalist, I am telling you that story. As a human being, uh, it is just absolutely stunning and appalling, isn't it? Well, and, and so if that's true, if these allegations pan out, how would that have happened? Like, if this was happening in game after game, as the player says, obviously we'll see what happens with these criminal charges with these specific players. But, I mean, does it go beyond that? Does responsibility also get assigned to, I don't know, team leaders, coaching staff? Well, exactly. The allegations, and we want to stress, of course, that these are allegations, and uh, we presume that things will become clearer uh, whenever, as this starts to play out. They should pull their heads out of their butts and actually figure out what they need to do and how they need to be better than what they've been doing. But at the end of the day, uh, Red, it's the coaches. Mm -hmm. I mean, the head coach, they have to be, all the coaching staff, they need to be on top of what's going on on their college campus and, and with their team. In this case, it's a first-year head coach, Greg Heyer, and uh, now placed on paid administrative leave. But often these coaches will make sure one of their assistant coaches or someone is linked to one of the players in the sense of that's their go-to person in the locker room. If there's a problem, I, I'm not even talking about something this egregious, but mm. just, you know, is everyone happy? Um, come to us. Let us know. There's always those lines of communication. So, again, the breakdown here is so extraordinary. So either you you knew and you covered it up, and again, there's no sense of that. We're just obviously surmising here where this story goes from here. But he, either he knew and covered it up or didn't tell anyone, 
or he didn't know. And frankly, that's also on him because he is the head coach of the uh, basketball team, the men's basketball team. That is his responsibility to know what's going on. And at the end of the day, as, as you well know and as listeners know, these are student athletes. Chancellor Dan Arvizu saying, quote, I was so heartbroken and sickened to hear about these hazing allegations. Hazing is a despicable act. NMSU policy strictly prohibits hazing in all forms, and it's something we simply will not tolerate. At the end of the day, these are 18 to 22, 23 year olds who, and this is what the chancellor was talking about, who are basically given over to the university from their families and um, how something like this could just keep going unchecked, mm. uh, allegedly, for months with a very high-profile program. Men's basketball is, is, you know, football, men's basketball, women's basketball. Those are those high-profile programs on all college campuses. And that is also just, uh, again, I, I, I'm running out of adjectives, but that is also just stunning. Well, and so New Mexico State then comes out and says, Men's basketball is done. We're finished. Definitely for this year. And then, I mean, is it even unclear what happens in the years after? H how significant is that for a team, but also just a, a school or an entire sport? It doesn't happen very often. In fact, it's hard for me to remember anything quite like this. Certainly, you had something like uh, SMU when they had football uh, improprieties. They shut down their football program. And literally, it was called the death penalty. They, <laughs> there was no more football program at SMU right. for a, a couple of years, and then they built it back up. Penn State football program did not shut down. There were, were calls. I, even as a journalist, as a, a columnist, um, talked about they need to stop playing football for a couple of years. They didn't do that. Um, they say they cleaned everything up, and, of course, it, a lot of it had been a long time earlier. Jerry Sandusky is in jail. Uh, Joe Paterno, the head coach, is dead. It's, he died not long after. So the bottom line is it is a, definitely a new uh, situation at Penn State. But, but to stop everything, to literally say, as the chancellor of the university did, we're done, to me, putting on my columnist hat, I would say absolutely. Now knowing what is in this police report, that was absolutely the right thing to do by the chancellor, by the leadership of New Mexico State. Um, just shut it all down, uh, try to figure out what happened, and of course, try to make sure it never happens again. It is really disturbing accusations, if true. Uh, Christine Brennan from USA Today, ABC News contributor. Thank you so much. Brad, my pleasure. Thank you. All right, one more quick break. When we come back, everyone seems to think they're an above average tipper. Terrible news, at least half of us are wrong. One last thing is next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. And one last thing. Personal question, how much do you tip? Don't be shy. After all, the employees are certainly watching. The thing they do now is they turn the screen towards you, so you kind of feel compelled to give something. Right. Even though it's takeaway, so you haven't... Did you tip them? We did. Well, we always do. I mean, everything's super expensive these days. I only tip <laughs> when there's restaurant service, really, or taxis. Recently, ABC's Trevor Alt began asking around to figure out, is it just me, or are we all being asked for way more tips? Trevor, was this story just a way to find out how to avoid <laughs> tipping people? Like, why were you interested in this? Oh, well, I'm not going to commit to that, but I think that we've all had that experience where it's like, you cracked open a beer for me and your suggestion on the square tablet is I tip you $2 minimum. Turns out this is an actual phenomenon. Some call it tipflation, in which more and more professions are unabashedly asking for gratuity. And that's led to another trendy phrase, tipping fatigue. Today I went to Shake Shack and there's nobody up at the counter. You go up to a kiosk and a little computer screen and blip, 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 you push in everything you're gonna order. And when you know it, the next screen that pops up when you're through is tip. I work here now. You should be tipping me. It really springs out of two trends. One of them is a digital one. Little electronic kiosks and mobile payment prompts have made it so easy to ask for a tip, it's almost silly not to. Because what's the worst case scenario? They just say no. The other reason for the sudden uptick is a cultural one. 
really in recent years, this movement started from a place of generosity and positivity. People wanting to help out those essential workers who weren't going to be making as much money during the pandemic when they really needed it. Together, the good vibes and the technology have led to more and more pressure on customers. I've noticed it when I go to concerts and I buy a t-shirt from the merch stand and the screen says, do you want to tip me $2 for handing you this t-shirt? And I do, I do, because I feel bad. Or, no, that's wrong. I'm giving myself too too much credit. I do because I don't want to be the guy that doesn't tip. Hmm. And that's basically what people are expressing frustration with. Now, you might be wondering, back in my day, this wasn't a thing. Didn't it used to be simpler? Well, no, not really. Tipping in the U.S. in particular, uh, that counts suggests that travel is between Europe and the United States. Uh, in the second half of the 19th century, uh, credited for bringing tipping to the U.S., where you have wealthy Americans who had discovered this tradition and wanted to seem aristocratic, and so they began to tip when they returned back home. As Professor Quabena Dunkor from Stanford, who studies tipping, he says what began as a kind of, aha, here's an extra tuppence for the bellboy, morphed from a bit of gratitude, to then a way to show off, to then a tool to underpay former slaves, and eventually a weird dance of societal expectations. And he should know, he put himself through school as a cab driver. Tipping was a major source of my income. So give or take about 15 to 25 percent of my earnings uh, came from tips. Uh, Given that I'm from Ghana, I found tipping to be quite peculiar. That said, there's a big difference right now between people casually soliciting tips, like at your hardware store, and establishments where they are expected. A meal from a local restaurant. Instead of delivery, I got pickup. Like I rode my bike over there and I tipped a couple bucks online prior to be nice. But then when I get my order, they had circled my cheap tip with a question mark. And I'm like, all that money would have gone to a delivery <laughs> guy. And now like I'm getting shade from the kitchen staff. Like yep. what am I supposed to do, Trevor? Outing yourself as a bad tipper, Brad, on his own podcast. I didn't know this was part of the gig. And if you thought Trevor was going to say, nah, Brad, don't worry. Employees aren't keeping track of individual tips. You're wrong. Some of the workers that I would talk to, they were very upfront about the fact that they're like, listen, I don't want to put any pressure on anybody. I'm not like staring them down as they're tipping me. But as soon as they sign the check and they bring it back to the register, they're looking down how much did that person pay me. I do like to see how much the people tip just because like it's kind of like a little game. It's like, I think you're going to tip a lot, but I don't know if you are, you know, so. <laughs> it's like a guessing game. Almost, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like. Now, there's obviously an argument to be made that the true culprit here is not Square or Venmo or the pandemic. It's the low hour hourly wages for so many workers that they would have to rely on your gratuity. However, when Trevor asked restaurant staffs about whether they'd prefer a consistently good wage or the current system, not only did managers say this was more fair, but many workers said the same. After all, in this environment, the good tips outweigh the bad. By the way, if supporting local servers has nothing to do with it, if you're only tipping because of social pressure, well, at least remember, being a good tipper always impresses a Valentine's date. Dollar, dollar bills, y'all. Have a good rest of your day. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. America's number one news source. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting in Mannington, West Virginia, I'm Mike Kajachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now on America This Morning, terrifying moments on a busy university campus, a deadly mass shooting, and the gunman on the run last night for hours. Everyone's freaked out, everyone's terrified, and I, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's truly a lot. Students at Michigan State barricading in classrooms and dorms. A second shooting reported, police releasing images of the suspect, later revealing he had turned the gun on himself. In the end, three students are dead, several in critical condition, what we're now learning about the suspect. New details overnight about the efforts to shoot down flying objects over the U.S. and Canada. Word this morning that the first missile targeting an object over Michigan missed its target. Plus, what the U.S. military has now recovered from that Chinese spy balloon shot down over the Atlantic. Wall Street awaiting a key new report today on inflation. The prices you pay at the grocery store and gas station, what it could mean for the future of interest rates. Plus, the deadly U-Haul truck rampage in New York City, what police are revealing about the 62-year-old suspect. Later, the new push to start school later in the morning, gaining momentum. And the fierce reaction as a popular Italian restaurant makes the controversial decision to ban children. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Tuesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. And I'm Rena Roy, in for Rhiannon. We begin with the breaking news from Michigan State University. At least three people killed in a shooting on campus. Everybody. Our Spartan community is reeling today. I want to start by thanking law enforcement, including the Michigan State University Police, the Michigan State Police, the FBI, all of our local agencies, first responders, local departments, and officers as far away as Oakland County for their efforts last night. I also want to thank the incredible medical professionals at Sparrow who are working hard to care for those injured, as well as all the community members that shared tips so that um, our law enforcement could act. We mourn the loss of beautiful souls today and pray for those who are continuing to fight for their lives. Every Spartan student, parent, and staff member should know that Michiganders and Americans everywhere are thinking of you today. President Biden and I spoke last night. He pledged his support and the thoughts of an entire nation. And we will work together to do what is necessary to help MSU community heal. We're all broken by an all too familiar feeling. Another place that is supposed to be about community and togetherness shattered by bullets and bloodshed. We know this is a uniquely American problem. Today is the fifth anniversary of the Parkland shooting. We're mere weeks past the Lunar New Year shooting at a dance hall and a few months past a shooting at an elementary school in Uvalde. And looking back at a year marked by shootings at grocery stores, parades, and so many other ordinary everyday situations, we cannot keep living like this. 
Our children are scared to go to school. People feel unsafe in their houses of worship or local stores. Too many of us scan rooms for exits when we enter them. And many of us have gone through the grim exercise of figuring out who our last call would be to. Last night, a lot of kids on this campus made those calls. They worried for their lives and for their friends, for their fellow Spartans. Parents across Michigan were on pins and needles, calling their kids to tell them that they love them. As parents, we tell our kids, it's gonna be okay. We say that all the time. But the truth is, words are not good enough. We must act and we will. But today, let's hold the MSU and East Lansing communities close. And let's think of the families and friends of those who have lost, those fighting for their lives, and the countless Michiganders whose lives are forever changed by yesterday's shooting. We will get through this together. And we will do it with the full support of the state of Michigan and the U.S. federal government. And with that, I would like to hand this over to our Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin. Thanks, Governor. Um, I want to echo what the governor said about the response of law enforcement. Uh, those of you who might have been listening on the scanner, <clears throat> you heard how deeply complex this operation was yesterday with young people calling in tips constantly with a, a, just a, an unbelievable, unbelievably difficult area of environment to navigate. Uh, law enforcement did an incredible job. We had hundreds respond from across the state. Um, and I just I think it's a testament um, to those who hold the thin blue line for us, the ones that hesitate or do not hesitate um, when we need them. Um, and I think we should recognize how desperately needed they were last night um, and in our society in general. Um, I want to thank the doctors and nurses and staff at Sparrow Hospital. They were on it. Um, no one wants to live through a mass shooting like this, but they were prepared and they handled it with grace and humanity. Um, as the representative of Oxford, Michigan, I cannot believe that I am here again doing this 15 months later. And I am filled with rage that we have to have another press conference to talk about our children being killed in their schools. And I would say that you either care about protecting kids or you don't. You either care about having an open, honest conversation about what is going on in our society or you don't. But please don't tell me you care about the safety of children if you're not willing to have a conversation about keeping them safe in a place that should be a sanctuary. Now, the Spartan community is incredibly uh, connected and proud. We've already seen people come together. But for me, the most haunting picture of last night was watching the cameras pan through the crowds and seeing a young person wearing an Oxford Strong sweatshirt. The sweatshirts that were handed out after those kids lived through a school shooting 15 months ago. And we have children in Michigan who are living through their second school shooting in under a year and a half. If this is not a wake up call to do something, I don't know what is. In the meantime, I feel confident that our law enforcement is doing everything that they can to understand the situation. I'm thrilled that federal law enforcement is on scene bringing their resources to the fight. <clears throat> we're not gonna rest until we understand but I think the fact that we're having this conference so quickly after another mass shooting in our state should be a statement in and of itself. Thanks very much. That's okay. Well, on behalf of the, the community, uh, I'm Mayor Andy Shore. Uh, Mayor Ron Bacon, East Lansing. Uh, City of Lansing. Um, this is the this is the morning that nobody ever wants to have. This is the day that nobody ever wants to be standing up at a lectern. When you get elected, you want to talk about the great things in your community and not this. Um, but here we are. Um, I, I do want to thank the the Lansing residents who who stood up. These many many tips you've heard about came in from from many of our residents, and as a result, the the shooter was identified, and um, and the threat was neutralized. So. We are very proud of our citizens in Lansing. Um, there's going to be so much fear. It's not just the students, it's the community. I've heard from parents and citizens who didn't know what was going on. Um, so I want to share, uh, we have a community mental health resource that is open 24-7. Um, 
It's a crisis services department, 517-346-8200. Uh, and I also want to share in, in the incredible job that was done by our law enforcement, um, LPD, ELPD, uh, state police, Ingham County, and of course, MSU. Um, this is what they train for. And today and yesterday, they were able to show that, that they are prepared. It's not something you ever want to do when you train, but they were prepared and, and uh, they were excellent. As of today, uh, East Lansing Hanna Center will be available to students uh, in need of resources.